Everybody that loves the Lord, say amen. Amen, brother. I'll say two things before I read the text. Share the burden with you on our heart. Pardon me for one moment. I believe in a Christian school. I was raised in a Christian school. I'll tell you why I believe that Christian school, you can't have a moment like this without all the structure already being in place. Somebody having a Christian Amen. school. Amen. Amen. You're in, it's been said, you're in a ship, I'm going to call it an ark. You're not in Noah's ark so much, you're in Moses' ark. Amen. It's what the Holy Ghost showed me when I started my Christian school, when I pastored. We are in the last days. Devils are loose out of the pit that have never been here before, not since the days of Noah. Can I get a witness? The devil's trying to kill all the godly babies. Can I get a witness? That's it's what they're doing in Moses' day and what they're doing in our day. God spared Moses. They come to his house to kill him, and his sister and him, and mama, they put him in a little ark and dabbed it. Yeah, sealed it off. Yeah, yeah. Amen. And you youngins don't know it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. But you're sliding through the, through the most evil, dangerous hour it's ever yeah. been in time. Yeah. Right down the Nile River and the crocodiles yeah. and Pharaoh. Yeah. And God's got you in a little container. I'm going to tell you why I believe God could put a blessing on this morning in a Christian school that he can't put on anything else. And i tell you what I believe it is. You children are surrounded with sacrifice. Pastor lays his whole ministry down to have a Christian school. None of you would understand that except the pastors who have a school. Oh, what a world it'd be, pastor of that school. <laughs> you lay your whole ministry on the line to do a thing like have a Christian school. And then your parents sacrifice their life. They change their lifestyle from the American lifestyle and sacrifice their time and money and a lot of trouble and a lot of persecution. And a great price is paid beyond money to have you in a Christian school. Amen. Amen. And your church sacrifices Amen. to have a Christian school. Yes. Yes. And there are people that are with you today. Teachers. Yes. Men who could be doing a lot with their life, but they heard the call. And they're over here, and there's, there's something called a youth director, a youth pastor, a youth helper, school principal, school teacher, and the ladies. The church mothers that come down to the church with their youngins, and you're surrounded with sacrifice. There's one thing God honors, and He honors sacrifice. And Brother McCauley, I believe the reason that God breathed on these things it's caused a lot of people have, have laid their life on the line to put you youngins in a little ark. Sliding right through them old crocodiles. <laughs> and I'm a believer. And I'm for it. And anybody ain't for it ain't got good sense. Needs to be smacked upside the head, probably twice. Goofy. When the adults win the world, then you come back and tell the children how to do it. The weak 
weekend of July the 23rd, our annual Preacher Boys Camp Meeting and Youth Rally, the Open Air Tabernacle in Ringo. We'll make sure you get a brochure. You men make a note of that and get these youngins to that open air sawdust meeting. I don't believe you need a contemporary rock service to win these children. I'm getting as far down the old path I can. I'm thinking about wearing overalls and chewing tobacco. I really am. Seems like it works out pretty good for some of my friends. I'm getting as far away from these little effeminate, demon-possessed, contemporary movement I'm against stuff that ain't even wrong because I'm so much against it. If it ain't, don't smell or look or taste or a bunch of people around it, it ain't old-time religion, I'm not for it. I find a text to be against it after a while. Give me a strongest concordance. Enough time, I'll come up with something. I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 11. I want to comment on this. I've already said my two things, but I have a comment now before I read my text. I thought it was wonderful that there's a bunch of children here that know how to approach God at an altar. Isn't that wonderful? That's just wonderful. That's, and that's part of that sacrifice, young, and you're surrounded by sacrifice. There's people who made themselves a living sacrifice so you could be in that little Moses ark and the crocodiles not get you in this hour. And I thought it was wonderful that children know how to weep and worship and approach God I want to talk to you about something for a little while this morning. I was born and raised in this, just like you. I'm 40. I'm age 40. And the thing I've learned about 40 is the old people think you're young. And the young people think you're old. And it's a lonely little world to be in. And then you have to take care of both of those groups because you're the only one that's got an income. (laughs) And the old ones think you don't know anything because you're so young. And the young ones don't think you know anything because you're so old. And yet they're both eating your groceries. That was a comment that came out of nowhere. I didn't even, that had nothing to do with nothing. But I have been where you've been, sat in these very services when I was your age. Got on the old bus that morning, glad I didn't have to do paces and listen to teachers. And Christian's version of partying. <laughs> Taking a bus trip somewhere. I'm going to stop by McDonald's on the way home and either get a milkshake or get a straw and stick it in your buddy's milkshake. I've done a lot of that too. And I want you youngins to know that Satan's lying to you. The devil's lying to you. That drinking, smoking, doping, rock music, partying crowd are the most miserable people in the world. Now, I'm not even going to berate the subject because there's no way that we can change some of you from heading that direction. You're going that way because you want to. And we'll see you you in another lifetime. And you're going to be messed up. But there's some of you this morning to the Holy Ghost squeezing them little hearts. Because somebody stacks sacrifice up around you. And you're the thing being sacrificed, given to God. (laughs) And the only way God will take you is if you'll take God. 
And that's all it takes. You ain't got to be perfect. Your mom and daddy ain't figured out how to be perfect. We, we, you just got started. We don't expect you to have your act together. I always thought of goofy people trying to get teenagers to get their act together. <laughs> Are you kidding? They ain't even had time to get an act started. <laughs> All God wants is for you to want Him. Now I'm going to read out of Hebrews chapter 11 and talk to you about your salvation. There are two things you need. There are two things young people need. There's two things teenagers need. You're going to need it now and you're going to need it for what's coming in life. You need to get saved. That's the first thing that every young person needs. And usually you're about this age before you get saved. A lot of little youngins get saved. Age five, six, seven, we've seen that. But mostly, usually, it's teenagers. You come into that age of understanding and that age of where you're doing business with God. Yes. And you need, you need to get saved. Amen. And then you need to know you're saved. Amen. And that ain't anything you got to work up the Holy Ghost to help you know it. And the premise for my thought this morning, I come to Hebrews 11, where the heroes of the faith are. And if I had about all the time I wanted, which would be half the day, I'd preach on how to be a hero for God. Abel had the right witness. It said, by faith, Hebrews 11:4. Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Now the feature of Abel's life was it had the right witness. And that's not a witness where you go out and knock on a door and give somebody a track. This is a witness whereby God gave witness to his salvation. Amen. He's the first fella in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. <laughs> right. Amen. Young man got saved because he surrendered to the Lord and he got killed for getting saved. Never accomplished anything that <clears throat> this old world would think of as heroic. But the man got saved. The greatest thing you'll ever do in this life is get saved. And then he knew it because God testified to it. Abel had the right witness. Enoch in verse 5, he had the right walk. Genesis said he walked with God. And verse 7, there's Noah. He had the right work. Gave his life to do a life work that God called him to do. Oh, there's some of that in here this morning. There's preachers and singers and missionaries and evangelists and, and laborers and church builders and prayer warriors right here in this service today. Abraham had the right will. He obeyed when God called on him. And he got out there in Genesis 22 and offered up his only son Isaac. He kept that will broken before God. Now that's how you can be a hero. You have the right witness, the right walk, the right work, the right will. I want to focus on Abel and then get more focused on your salvation. Pardon me. Look in verse 4. By faith Abel offered unto God. Lord, I pray you'd help us this morning. It's been mighty rich, mighty sweet, mighty real. We could feel it. Lord, easing up on us and creeping up on us around here all through the morning service. But Lord God, I think the greatest work's in front of us for this service. I pray you'd save some youngins today. And I pray that the rest of you'd charge their heart with the Holy Ghost, high octane charge, knowing that they're a child of God. Lord, help us. Amen. Look in verse 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, 
by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Now here he is 6,000 years later on the other side of the world, and his ministry still going on. Can I get a witness right there? Amen. He got saved. My faith, that's believing what God said. Amen. Youngins, you've heard this your whole life. I hope it's fresh and real to you and, and means something to you. you. You'll never go wrong going with God. Amen. Your whole life will get messed up if you ever go against God right. and His Word. Right. By faith, that's what faith is. It sounds simple, but it's the Bible definition of faith. Faith is believing what God said. Amen. Amen, brother. And people who believe it act on it. By faith. Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than He came with the blood of a lamb. Can I get a witness right there? And that's how you're going to get in, is by the blood of the lamb. The book of Hebrews had much to say about the blood. Hebrews chapter 9 is the bloodiest chapter in your Bible. But not another chapter in the Bible with more blood in it than Hebrews chapter 9. And I'm glad that the blood of Christ is able to save us from our sins. One thing you youngins probably hadn't run into yet in your life is yourself. But you'll meet yourself after a while. Life's going by real fast and real sweet right now. But after a while, you're going to run into your sin and run into yourself. Yeah, you can be saved a long time and still begin to run into yourself and your sin. And you know this. No matter how bad it is, it ain't too bad for the blood. Yeah. Now you think of a hundred and thousand and one things you want to say to youngins. Don't do this. Don't go there. Please do this and go this way. And you can play them a thousand things out there and they won't get none of them. You got to get started with Jesus or you ain't going to get anywhere. And you better know what he done for you on Calvary. He did it for you. Calvary was for you. Calvary was for real. Calvary is for all. And Calvary is forever. You youngins better start at the cross. You better stay at the cross. The blood. And then he obtained a witness that he was righteous. God testified of his gifts. If there's anything we need, we need to be saved and we need to know we're saved. There's something wonderful in the book of Hebrews. Look in chapter 10, verse 22. There's full assurance. There's full assurance. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. I begin in verse 17. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Ain't it good to be saved? Amen. Where remission of these is, no more often for sin. Having therefore, and, I, and if you run these two words together, they work good. Brethren, boldness. Yeah. Got that brethren, boldness. I have an elder brother and I have a big father. Can I get a witness right there? I'm in the family. I'm a brother to the Lord. I'm a child of the Father. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. Here it comes. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Yes, what about that? Yes, Abel obtained the witness that he was righteous. He got saved because he came to God when it was time for him to come to God through the blood of a lamb that was slain. That's how you get saved is you come to God God's way. Amen. A lot of you youngins need to get saved. You better you go to hell if you don't. Say this, Jesus didn't die so you could go to heaven. 
You go to heaven if you get saved. But Jesus didn't die so you could go to heaven. He died so you could go to God. Heaven's not the goal. Being reconciled to your Creator, that's the goal. Jesus didn't die on Calvary so I could go to where there's a street of gold and a wall of jasper. He died on the cross and made a way for me to be returned to God. For me to be redeemed to God. For me to be reconciled to God. Be careful. You don't need to use psychology when you're preaching the gospel. Try to little pop psychology and entertainment or some sort of persuasion. Or, hey, man, don't you want to go to heaven? Yeah, I want to go to Six Flags too, and I can't get over there. (laughs) Jesus didn't die. You should go to heaven. He died so you could go back to God and be right with your God and be righteous with your God and be real before your God and be in a relation with your God. He died so you could be his and he could be yours. It is all right, youngins, to go all the way with God. Solomon said, I am my beloved's and his desires towards me. Give him all you got. Give him all your days. Give him all your energy. Give him all of your all of your life. Give him all of your soul. Give him all your mind. Give him all your body. Give him all you got. It's the greatest commandment to love the Lord thy God with all you got. Went back in Christmas time and went to the house, Maryland. We're from North Georgia, clarify that. <laughs> Mom and Dad's in Maryland because Dad's got some previous unconfessed sin, and if you do, <laughs> he's up there pastoring. And if you don't do right, God will make you go to Yankee places. <laughs> some of you boys don't do right, God will make you marry a Yankee woman. No more biscuits and gravy. It'd be like bagels and pumpernickel spread or something awful. She'll put you on low-cal, low-sugar Pop-Tarts. Brew you a little unsweetened tea, hot tea, hot tea. You better get right with God. You get right with God, God will give you one of these Georgia, Alabama girls. Not only put the meat on the table, they'll kill the meat for you. They'll go out in the woods. Kill it. Of course, don't you ever turn on them country girls. They'll kill you quick as they'll. So I went to Maryland. I had to explain all that why God made me go to Maryland. Went to Maryland, see mom and dad. And when we walked in, I didn't say, oh, children, look at this door. I didn't tell my little youngest, look at these walls. We didn't run in there and say, I want to lean down and touch the floor. No, I said, there's mama. There's grandma. Jesus didn't die so you could go see heaven. He died so you could get to God. And when we get there, we're not going to say, oh, look at that gate, look at that street. Of course, if you've been real poor, you may look at it for a minute. Whoa. (laughs) Whoa. Could have used a little of that, Lord. You're going to go see, you're going to run straight to the Lord. Young and it can be that way for you, you can be saved. Some of you have some rough, messed up families, divorce, dysfunction. Some of you kids are from wonderful children, Christians, home. You're from a wonderful, godly home. No matter where you youngins are from, you got to get saved. And one of the biggest problems I've seen with youngins that grow up in the middle of old-time religion is many of them get confused about am I saved or not. They get in these high services that I believe in. I don't believe in no formality. That's too close to Roman Catholicism. I don't believe in formalism. I don't believe in the contemporary. That's too 
close to acting gay to me, so I'm not going with that rap. Their women get called to preach, and the men grow long hair and wear jewelry. <laughs> Turns the women into men, the men into women. I'm not for it. I believe in old time religion. Children raised around the presence and power of God. It's hard to remember meeting God. Because he's been there the whole time. And in a meeting like this, some, somebody will jump up. I know the dear sister back here that is shouting. She's one of our Christian friends from our town. I don't think I'd embarrass her. She's told her testimony. She could tell you about, she's back there shouting. She could tell you what dope does. She could tell you what jail's like. And a lot of times somebody who gets saved out of a rough life jump up and shout in a meeting like this and the, and the devil start talking to you. You know, why don't you shout? So many of our young people that grow up in old-time religion, the greatest thing in the world is getting saved and knowing you're saved. And the whole reason that you're here is the whole thing that you can miss so easily. You need to get saved. You can have full assurance. Chapter 6 talks about full assurance. There's three little thoughts. There's three little thoughts, and I'm and I'm nearly done. I'm I'm exhorting. I got a lot of outlines, and I ain't got none of them with me. I'm a exhorting. There's three things, and I'll go ahead and tell you why I think a lot of people, a lot of Christian kids, are not sure if they're saved or not. A lot of them not sure of the how they got saved, exactly how it happened. A lot of them's not sure of the when it happened. And a lot of them's not sure if it happened. I'm going to talk about those three things, and you can see I've already gave all three of them to you, so I don't take me long until I hit long spells, then it's long. You need to get saved. You know one thing I learned about people who doubt their salvation? Lost people never doubt their salvation. It's not what a sinner does. Sinners who have never been enlightened, never been born again, never been saved, never been washed in the blood, never been regenerated by the Holy Ghost. They're blind, they're natural, they're going to hell, and they don't wake up worrying, am I really saved or not? If a lost person starts worrying about their eternal soul, it's not confusion, it's conviction. And a lost person doesn't move in confusion. They move in conviction. And the Holy Ghost says, you're lost. And then they're twins and they're touched and they're pricked in their heart. And the Holy Ghost saves lost people. Now, some of you need to get saved. I had a fellow come to me and he'd been worried about being saved for, for seven years now. I said, well, I'm pretty sure you're saved. He said, well, I said, lost men don't worry about it. Lost man's lost. He said, I'm telling you, I don't think I'm saying. I'm telling you, I think you are. He says, you care about my eternal soul? I said, sure I do. Well, I ain't worried about you. Well, boy, y'all are looking at me like a woodpecker at a concrete block. Some you want to play the, you want to live in the endless turmoil of the next decade. I'm saved, I'm not saved. I, don't, I think I'm saved. I don't know if I'm saved. And lost people don't live like. If you're saved, then the devil, he'll try to mess with your mind. But he don't mess with a lost man's mind. He got it sealed off. A lost man get under conviction. I tell you how conviction works. The Holy Ghost when he starts convincing. He's pretty convincing. 
convicting. Conviction convinces you. Doesn't confuse you. God is not the author of. And when he has come, he'll reprove. And when he starts to prove and reprove, in a little while, he'll have it proved. A lot of church youngins that God has saved, they don't know if they're saved or not a lot of times because of the high caliber of spirituality in our services and, and they get caught along and, and they don't know or not sure of how it happened. Well, let me say it like this. I'm going to tell you how my daddy got saved. He had a godly mama that prayed for him, but he had a pretty bad daddy. His daddy was a drunk, a reprobate, did things to that family that they don't even speak of. And at the funeral when they buried the old man, and I didn't mean that the way, it, when they buried grandpa when he got old, died. Well, they met family they didn't even know they had because of what he had done. My daddy went overseas in the army, got his jaw broke twice, nearly got killed, come back to North Georgia, painting the town red, becoming the same cussed drunkard that his daddy had been. Hateful and full of hate. Fighting and cussing and turmoil. But he had a praying mom and a praying grandma. Can I get a witness right there? And one night down old Highway 41 below Chattanooga somewhere, the Holy Ghost pulled him off the side of the road. Doing 85 mile an hour under deep Holy Ghost conviction said the Holy Ghost sat down in the front seat with him and pulled him over. And he sat on the side of the highway trembling. Didn't know that, and he didn't know he could get saved. He just he thought God was come to kill him. And the only religious thing he could do, he said, I, God, I, "If you let me live to Sunday, I'll go to church with Mama." And my daddy never told this. I never heard him tell it in church. He was afraid he'd confuse people. He said, when he made God that promise, the lightning flashed, and he was looking at a bridge that the flood had took out. He'd have dove into hell if he'd have hit that bridge at 85 mile an hour. And he never told that lightning flash in part because he's afraid people would think that if they didn't have a lightning flash, they'd be... come to Dogwood Baptist Church that Sunday morning, couldn't drink coffee or open a letter between Thursday and Sunday. Can I get that's the Holy Ghost conviction? I'm skipping the details. Some guy to leave in a while. I probably won't be done in a while. <laughs> Sat on the back and trembled. And old brother Roy Gentry still pastor there today. That was in the late 60s and he's still there today. So I want all the little children to come up and sing to Junior. He hated that name because it was a reflection on his dad. Nobody knew that. And old daddy sat back there and then youngins got up and began to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Went through his heart like an arrow. Brother Gentry gave a good homiletical Bible college altar call. It went like this. Junior, get down here. Let God save you. That's long about your third year in Bible college, boys. They go through the altar worker procedure. Altar workers. Altar workers. Yeah. Junior, get down here. <laughs> Daddy said he tried, but he took that step and collapsed. Holy Ghost had him broke down. An old deacon and a young friend come back and they drug him to the altar with his toes a-dragging yeah. Forty-five minutes of thrashing on the altar. God cleaned him out of devils and depravities, and he got up and was born again. Yeah, man, 
Now I want to tell you how I got saved. I want to tell you how I got saved. I was a preacher's kid on the front row. I took two steps forward and that's it. And you youngins need to, whew, I don't know if it's the steroids or the Holy Ghost, but I'm feeling good. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's medication. I'm remembering stuff that never even happened. Yeah. And the devil's come by before me and said, you didn't see no lightning flash. You got a little, little bitty testimony. I was born to church people and stepped forward when I was nine. Sorry. That's the end of the story. <laughs> but that really ain't the end of my story. Because most people who got long testimonies have only got a few years left. Most people that's got long scars do not have long years left. Most people's got to write a book to tell their life conversion. And I'm glad God saves Harley Davidson if you got a Harley. I'm glad God saves gangsters and druggers and dopies and drugs and I see them every week where I preach somebody's hauled out of a crack house somebody's hauled out of a that was a little crack baby I see them every week and they can't get over it and usually they jump up and shout cause they're a little bit more excited than the rest of it about where they was and where they were going and what they were and what they were going to be if you ain't careful, the devil will mess you up. Because you got a little old. You know, when God saved Paul, the heavens were opened. Y'all remember that? Acts 9, the heavens opened. He got knocked off his donkey. He's laying on his rear end. Sorry, grown people. Laying on his back. Thunderings, a light from heaven. Jesus scolding you personally, <laughs> making an appearance to scold you. <laughs> the heavens open. But you go along there about Acts chapter 16, and there is a woman named Lydia sitting on the side of the river bank. Brother Cofield, I don't believe she ever moved. She was a gracious and a successful lady. And she is down there and she's laid up on the side of that river bank where many came to worship. And she had propped up on the elbow. And two preachers walked by. And in a s slow conversation and then just gently moved on. But the, and I'm staying with my King James Bible. Amen. And King James Bible said whose heart the Lord opened. In Acts 9, the apostle to the Gentiles, the apostle to the Gentiles, God opened the heavens to save him. But just turn a few pages and he saved somebody just by in a small conversation. People walking by. Wasn't no donkey on the ground. Wasn't no bridge fell out. It's just, it's just the gospel came. <laughs> the gospel came by her way. Her heart opened just a little. He stepped in, closed her up. They moved on, and with her elbows still in the grass, she got born again because she heard the word. I want you youngest to know something. Just cause lightning didn't flash and bridges didn't burn and fall out and donkeys get knocked over. From the same Jesus who opens the heavens is the same Jesus that can open your heart. 
and slide in and close her and nobody even know. I was nine years old that night when I went forward. Nobody shouted. Nobody ran. All the kids used to go to the altar. You don't know what I did? I went outside and threw rocks in the parking lot with the other one. <laughs> Been told not to a hundred times. <laughs> And I was a little embarrassed of what had just happened. And that's my memory. Now let's talk about when it happened. A lot of people get messed up on when it happened. Because I was 13 when I went down to an altar and got called to preach and got filled with the Holy Ghost and shouted till 2 o'clock in the morning. And I spent about a couple of decades going, I wonder if I probably got saved when I was 13. <laughs> when I was nine, I, was, I don't know. <laughs> but when I was 13, whoo, son. And my sister prayed when she was five and prayed when she was seven and prayed again when she was 11 and prayed again when she was 15. And every time, they, I'm really not saved. I want to be saved. And then you get in your 20s and the devil come along and says, if you don't know when you got saved, how can you even know you are saved? And church kids spend their life on the altars. Other people put us there and it's the greatest thing that happened to us. And then we learn to put ourselves there. And how many youngins across this country prayed when they was five and then prayed when they was nine and prayed when they was 11? And in some areas under some preaching, teenagers just get saved every time there's a meeting. The pressure's on. And they're so thoroughly confused in their mind about their sin nature and about their spiritual experiences. I like what Hebrews chapter 6 and chapter 10 said. I think it's right below them verses in chapter 10. He said, let us hold fast the profession. In Hebrews 10, 22, he said full assurance. In verse 23, he said just hold on to that. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. 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 promised. Here's what old Joe Parsons said. He said, many of you are confused about your salvation. He said, go back to that first profession, hang on to it. God ain't going to let you go to hell with you hanging on to Him. Brother Tim, here's what he said, Joe Parsons. And if I get in trouble with the brethren over this, we'll blame it on Joe Parsons. <laughs> brother Cole, Brother Reith, Brother Colefield. Joe Parsons said, most of you ain't got enough sense to know when you got born again. You better just hang on to that first profession. <laughs> Good. You watch this crowd who wants to run to a I can tell you the time and tell you the place. Once again, there's silence in heaven for half an hour. <laughs> Let me say this. If you have a time and you have a place, shout. Yeah. Enjoy it from here to glory. Yeah. But some of us have got a dozen times and places and we ain't sure yeah. which one. This kind of honesty cost me meetings. But it helps. It helps struggling people. It helps people. It helps people. It helps people. I can't tell you every time the Holy Ghost led me to preach this in the last six years, they line up weeping. And many of them say for the first time tonight, I know I'm saved just because just cause I don't know when I got saved. People like my daddy will never forget the time or the place. People like my wife come out of the world, daddy cussing, first thing I ever heard out of his mouth was blaspheming God's name. 
She remembers coming out of a deep, dark hole out in Egypt and looking yonder, and there's a city set on a hill. And she remembers walking up, and there's a cross. She'll tell you about it. She's here. But I was born at the foot of that cross, and I don't ever remember seeing it. I grew up underneath it. I grew up under it, bumping into it. I grew up with a bunch of badness hanging around it, didn't treat it right. I couldn't see the tree for the forest. And I was born at the foot of the tree. If you got a time and a place, testify. Thrill us. Write songs, preach sermons, shout it out. If you ain't got a time or a place, do you have a Savior? Let me say it like this. Let me say it. That's the steroids. Let me say it like this. I can't remember. I'm having a mental block. I cannot remember me and Jennifer's wedding anniversary. If she's in the room and somebody asks. I can tell you right now. There's too many fours and fives and six. We got kids born on the fourth and, the, and oh no, I was born on the fifth. My girls born on the sixth, and I was married on the fourth. And there's a lot of fours and sixes all right there, and children's birthdays and birthdays and anniversaries. And when somebody asked me for the life of me, I can't remember if it's May the fourth or May the sixth, and that's the truth. And right now I'm not sure which one it is. It was '96. It's probably the fourth or the, it could be the sixth. You see my problem. And if she's in a room, I never get it right. Which costs me a trip to the mall every time just to make that right. And you ain't coming back with an umbrella either or nothing. They'll say, when did you get married? I just get all tore up and slam out of the frame and can't give you the right date. So I finally just grab her and say, this is my wife, and I know I'm married. <laughs> and I don't have the date for you, but I've got the date. Yeah. Yeah. The date's here. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, man. Amen. The date's here. Amen. Can I be painfully honest? Cost me meetings, but it helps people. I don't know when I got saved. Amen. Yeah. I was nine when I came. I was 13 when it felt like something happened. But I came sincerely when I was nine. But I know I got, woo, July 29, 82, woo. And I tell you, I don't know the date, but I have the date here today. <laughs> I've got Jesus. I've got the Holy Ghost. I've had him all these years. He's been with me. I'm his. He's mine. I mean, I can tell you the date, but I can tell you about the date. And I know a lot of people throwing around the date, and they act like they never had a date with Jesus. They got a date, but they ain't never been out on a date with him because they don't know nothing about him. Uh, Hadn't showed him to nobody in 20 years. I'm just telling you, if you don't know if you were 5 or 7 or 11 or 13, you're not trusting an experience. You're not trusting something written down in the fly leaf of the family Bible. You're trusting the gospel promise. Amen. You're trusting the gospel promise. If you come to me, I'll take you. Amen. And my sister said, Lord, I did. I came then and then and then and then and then. He said, and I took you. She said, okay. Don't know how. You're not sure if how was dramatic enough. You're not sure if when can get figured out. 
Some of you are not even sure if it ever happened or not. What you need to do is run to Jesus and fling yourself on him. He is faithful. That promise. That's why you can hold on to that. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. For he is faithful. Who cares how it happened? Who cares if the heavens opened or your little heart opened? The same Jesus took the same blood, washed away the same sin, guaranteed you for the same glory and the same God and made you fireproof from the same lake of fire. Now some of you youngins need, you need to get saved because you just, you've never been born again. And some of you need to know you're saved or you ain't going to be worth shooting until you're out in your 30s somewhere. And if you wrestle with this, if you wrestle with doubt in your salvation, good preaching will fix it. And the good Holy Ghost will fix it. I was in a meeting, Brother McCulley. Large meeting. Had an altar call, had a second altar call. Brother Cofield and a 16-year-old boy got on the altar. 45 minutes. They prayed over him. They prayed around him. They prayed under him. Some told him to hang on. Some told him to turn loose. I was listening. Some of them screamed, tried to make him scream. They read him half the Bible. I appreciate all the sincere people wanting to help somebody. Then his pastor stood up and said, this boy's been doing this for two years trying to get saved. And I felt that spirit of confusion that was in that boy ripple throughout all that congregation. I went up to the moderator pastor. I said, uh, and I'd preached that night. I said, can I go back to the pulpit and say something? It cost me some meetings, but it helped some people. I said, this boy over here on the altar trying to get saved. I said, ain't nothing going to happen for that boy in this service. You can just close her down and go to the house. Forget it. This boy's only going to get help when he gets out there by himself somewhere under a tree. The Holy Ghost is going to whisper real softly to his heart. And when he talks to him, he's going to tell him, you're saved. Because God don't play mind games. He don't play tricks. And he don't refuse to save 16-year-old boys who are sincerely coming. Now, you've heard Holy Ghost conviction stories. Now, I told you one this morning about my daddy. But I told you one about me, too. I there. I heard the gospel. He drew me. He wanted me. He came to where I was. I didn't have a bridge fall out or a lightning flash or a donkey to throw me to the... But I came to him because he came to me. And I want all you youngins with a little short testimonies to know something. You got the rest of your life to build a real testimony. And they'll open those books at the judgment seat. Abel had a short life. He got saved and he got assurance about it. And God took him to heaven. And his ministry is still operating right here 6,000 years later on the other side of the world. I want you to bow your heads. I hope somebody got some help. Sister Carly's coming. Our heads are bowed. I don't know what to tell you young people. Some of you need to get saved because you've never been born again. You ought to come to Jesus. Most teenagers need to be saved. It's because they've not been saved yet. You say, preacher, but I've already come half my life. Well, if you've come to the Lord, why don't you believe him? you believe him, you'll have that sweet peace. You've come to him and he's taken you in. 
He said, but I ain't sure about how it happened. I ain't sure when it happened. I'm not even sure if it happened. If you ever came to him sincerely, he, it's because he came to you. I want you to stand. Our heads are bowed. I'm not looking for a great altar call. I'm not looking for great numbers. Usually it's the preaching of this message that helps people. It's not. They get help right in the pew. But I want a few of you preachers to pray. You can pray where you're at. But pray that God would touch the hearts and minds of these, of these young people. And if some need to come be saved, or if some need to come and take hold of Christ and hear Him say that I've been here all along, child, take hold of Him. He's been there all the while. Many of y'all know the old song she's playing. Help me sing it. All to Jesus.